Let us all take a minute to honor the memory of WCW. But don't do that. If you start, wait, what's wrong with you? WCW died like 20 years ago. Of course it sucks and we all miss it, but sometimes you just gotta accept that things are gone. And believe you me, World Championship Wrestling is gone. If you look at those last two years, it was probably gone even before it was killed. But look, what we can do is we can use our brains and we can get in our DeLoreans and we can go back in time, figuratively speaking, and we can enjoy the good stuff that WCW did give us. So that's what we're going to do today here on What Culture Wrestling. Because my name is Simon Miller. Thank you very much for joining me. And this is eight WCW ideas that didn't last. Number eight, spin the wheel and make the deal. Now we have seen other promotions do a similar idea in the interim, but if we go back to 1992 and Halloween Havoc, this is the premise the fans were sold on. Two people were gonna spin a wheel and wherever it landed was going to tell you what the stipulation of the match was. It created quite the suspense. It mean when you did tune in, you kind of felt on the same page as Sting and Jake Roberts who were tied up in all of this madness. They were gonna spin the damn thing and who the hell knows what they were gonna get. Maybe it'd be a death match, maybe it'd be a ladder match, maybe it'd be some kind of fire match. But again, this is WCW and nobody had the bright idea to rig the wheel. So do you know what we ended up with? A coal miner's glove match, whatever the hell they call it. And if you're now wondering, well, what the hell is that? I don't think anybody knows, but it was basically the same as a something on a pole match, but it was a glove. And I guess the glove is so heavy, if you were able to get it and put it on and punch your opponent in the face, well, it hurt a bit. It was Sting who was able to get his hands on this particular piece of clothing and he punched Jake Roberts. And not only did that mean that Sting had won, but then Jake Roberts' his own snake attacked him and he probably went home that night and was like, man, I had a really shibby day. And he did. Number seven, running the gauntlet. Yet another concept that has been kind of run into the ground because we've seen so many gauntlet matches on Raw over the last few years. When you once again go back to the late 80s when WCW was doing it, they came up with a spin and a twist that actually made it quite inventive and actually made it quite original and the fact you could do it time and time again and the fans were still invested. Tied into the power hour, which began in 1989, this wasn't about winning a series of matches back to back. It was about winning a series of matches, namely three, over the entire weekend of television programming. So if you were able to do good on Saturday, Sunday, Friday and all of that, you would then win $15,000 and if you didn't, I don't know, Sid Justice just popped up. Sid Justice? Sid Justice just popped up and he powerbombed you. And then you were like, oh no. Only two men in history were ever tough enough to get through this gauntlet. They just happened to be both the Steiner brothers. And then we got to 1990 and World Championship Wrestling decided to ditch this. I think that was a mistake. Number six, Ted DiBiase financing the NWO. When the NWO, the New World Order, first formed at Bash in the Beach, there was one major question that had to be answered. Why were these three doing this? And of course, there was the narrative that had come from the WWF to destroy WCW, but you needed more than that. Like, that's a cool thing to do, but what was really in it for Hulk Hogan, Kevin Nash, and Scott Hall? On top of this, how on earth were they going to afford it? Because no matter what kind of business venture you get into, you need the finances to back it up. But WCW thought outside the box here, and they were like, all right, well, we're bringing Ted DiBiase. He's the million dollar man, and he can be the man with the cash. So even though Hogan, Nash, and Hall were to be unemployed because don't forget WCW hadn't given them contracts they were here on their own regard Ted DiBiase was backing them up and that's how they were able to get WCW employees to come to the dark side because I know Ted DiBiase was probably going ha, 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 ha. everybody's got a price as we know eventually Eric Bischoff took on this role and I will concede that made even more sense because he was supposed to be running WCW so I guess he had his head turned but it also meant goodbye to DiBiase and I thought that was a little bit of a shame. Number five, the NBC TV deal. In the summer of 1998, WCW was on top of the world. Like if you looked out your window, you probably would have seen the company just sat on the earth. And while you could see the cracks if you had a keen eye, no one cared about that at the time. They were making millions, they were making mega stars, and everybody had massive smiles on their faces, especially Ted Turner. He was probably dancing away. So much good was happening here too that NBC, the American television network that hadn't touched wrestling since the golden era of the 80s, saw what was going down, saw Hulk Hogan's name, and they approached World Championship Wrestling and went, look, the NBA is locked out right now. They ain't playing. Why don't we take your wrestling and throw it back out there 
on our station. They even agreed three shows in principle that would air in 1999, one of which would have gone against WWF's WrestleMania, and can you believe it? And we would have had another on New Year's Eve or New Year's Day. So you'd be there getting wasted at 11.59, then you'd be like, oh sweet, it's Raven. I love Raven. Don't we all love Raven? Yes. Unfortunately, word of this eventually got to Harvey Schiller, who was Eric Bischoff's boss, and he told Eric in no uncertain terms that both me and Ted, we're not happy with NBC making a profit of our company, so we are gonna pull the rug out from under this and kill it and talk about not seeing the bigger picture. Sooner rather than later, the basketball was back and this was never talked of again. And I tell you this, if it had gone on, maybe WCW wouldn't have died. And before Raven, the spoiled rich kid. See, there was a reason I mentioned Raven a second ago, and that's because we're gonna talk about him proper now, and we all remember the character, and some of us remember it quite fondly. Raven was basically your typical grungy emo kid that loved listening to Nirvana, he cut morose promos, and he was so sad, when he got to the ring, he'd just slump in the corner, and probably just, I don't know, imagine himself painting his room black. After his flock had disbanded though, and when he turned his back on best friend Canyon, WCW came up with this, I'll go interesting, not necessarily awesome, but interesting idea that he was actually from a privileged middle class family. Because I kid you not, on an episode of Nitro, out came his mum and looked at Raven and said, Raven, would you stop this? Would you stop with all this pretense? You know what's happening back at the family home. You need to stop being such a child. So the story here was that Raven had been playing up to everything he'd been playing up to just to try and make some money. So he was like a con artist. And given how long he had been doing this persona, I thought that was quite a cool twist. It gave him some layers, it gave him some depth. There were also some goofy promos where people were just hanging out at Raven's pool, but like most things in WCW, one day it just stopped and nobody explained why. And it's not like WWE would do that, would they? Oh no, wait. What the flub happened to the hacker? Number three, the Crockett Cup. Now the Crockett Cup wasn't technically a WCW idea, but after Ted Turner had bought Crockett Promotions in 1988, he now owned all of this stuff. And could WCW have actually done something with this? Yes, but instead they just buried it into the ground like it was some kind of dead horse. And the cup itself was so simple, yet it was so effective because over the course of two days, 24 teams would come together and whoever came out of top would win $1 million. Now this was wrestling $1 million, which meant it was a figure that was made up but again who can't buy into something like this it's like real sports and yes if you watch nxt it may sound familiar some of the teams that won this too i mean in 1986 it was the road warriors in 1987 it was nikita kolov and dusty Rhodes, and the following year it was sting and lex luger and did that help sting and lex luger out yes it did it set them on the path to stardom all three of these tournaments did absolutely gangbusters at the gate as well audiences pour in to see this but then yeah as soon as ted turner bought it they just didn't use it anymore because that wasn't their creation so they didn't want to touch it. And who does that sound like? Oh, that's right, Vincent Kennedy McMahon. If something is good, damn it, keep it good and keep using it. Number two, WCW's relaunch. Nowadays, when you reboot a franchise, everybody gets excited. Like, oh, it's a fresh start and I can't wait to see what they're gonna do and they can change the story. But that was not the case in the year 2000. In fact, if you had to reboot something at the turn of millennium, you may as well have held up a sign that says, oh yeah, I failed and I'm gonna start again and it was the same for WCW. So in April of that year, after World Championship Wrestling had decided to put Eric Bischoff and Vince Russo together as some kind of double mega, oh my gosh, I can't believe in booking group, they actually came to the ring and told us all everything you knew beforehand just forget about it, we're hitting the reset button and we are indeed starting again. So during a show that was dubbed the night the world will change forever or something like that, every single title was vacated, every single storyline was dropped, and if you had never tuned in before, you could start here, it was day one, it was brand new. And the major point of all this was to tell you that no longer was WCW gonna focus on the old guard and they were gonna bring in new stars like Booker T, Kidman, and Rey Mysterio, and they even came together as the new blood. And just to underline that the legends are out the door, they came together as like the Millionaires Club, and that's the little feud we had. And this would have been great if we had just stuck to the plan. In fact, tying into the title of this video, it would have been awesome, but we didn't. Before long, the new blood were just the NWO, and then the Millionaires Club with Hall and Nash were getting sympathy on their shoulders. It was like, oh my gosh, we're actually back to where we were. So now if we do need to change this, we're gonna have to hit reboot again. We didn't do that. And instead, one year later, the company was finished. Number one, the Black Scorpion. Do you know who everybody thought was in the giant egg at Survivor Series when the gobbledygooker popped out in 1990? People actually believed 
it was going to be Ric Flair. I mean, they didn't think he was going to come out in the costume. They just thought that for some reason, the Nature Boy, one of the greatest wrestlers ever, was going to debut in the WWF by coming out of an egg. What is actually quite incredible, though, is that over in WCW, we were having a Ric Flair reveal, but this one, Ric Flair himself wasn't actually happy with. Maybe you should have done it. And to explain all of this, we need to go back to 1989, when WCW did hire Jim Hurd, a dude who before this had been managing pizza companies, to run WCW, and that was so bad straight away because Jim Hurd came in, he saw the WWF and it being all cartoony, he went, we should be like that. And everyone in WCW was like, no, we're the alternative product, you know, we're like good old fashioned wrestling. But Hurd didn't care, and then he probably ate some pepperoni. This pissed off Ole Anderson, who was booking the thing, and he decided, all right, well, I'm just gonna start throwing ludicrous ideas out there to see what stick. And while most of these missed, one actually hit. Because in August 1990, a bunch of vignettes started to wear saying the Black Scorpion was coming to World Championship Wrestling and that he was a former friend of Sting's, but now he hates the World Champion, so who better watch his back? This actually lit some intrigue under the fans' asses because they tried to figure out who on earth this could be. At one point, people thought maybe it'd be the Ultimate Warrior because obviously him and Sting started in the same promotion as a tag team. And the more the tension built, the more WCW panicked because as you see, or as I'm about to tell you, they didn't know who the Black Scorpion was be. Even though he was on their television, they were still trying to figure it out backstage. Because of this, every time he cut a promo or spoke, they masked his voice. It was like, I can't even do the impression, but it sounded all dark and terrifying. And eventually Ole Anderson said, look, I used to have a relationship with Sting. I will just be the Black Scorpion. And then unfortunately he went and broke his arm, so he was out. It all built to a head at Starcade 90 when the Black Scorpion said that he would challenge Sting for his world championship and if he was unable to beat him, he would unmask. With few other options, it did turn out to be Ric Flair, which pissed Jim Hurd off so much because him and Ric Flair did not get in, he fired Ole Anderson. And all of this, my friends, when you watch it back with that knowledge, is absolute Clap trap. And I tell you, man, sometimes WCW, it continues to boggle the mind and it probably will do forevermore. But do you remember any other awesome ideas from WCW that, of course, didn't last? Let us know in the comments below and don't forget to like the video, share the video, and subscribe. Then head over to whatculture.com, read yourself some articles, follow what culture on Twitter at whatculture.wwe, breathe, and watch more videos here on What Culture Wrestling. My name is Simon from What Culture, and just to fill you in, because people get a little bit crazy, I was always a WWF guy as a kid. But when I flick on that old there WCW when I could, you bet your ass, because it doesn't matter at the end of the day. Wrestling is wrestling, and when wrestling is good, wrestling is great. I'll see you soon.